you got a Bible handy, please grab your Bible and turn to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. And uh, we'll be glad to be here this afternoon. Uh, Bob said it might be called night. I think it's still afternoon, but uh, we won't argue that point. I'm glad to be here. Appreciate uh, those of you who have made it very clear that you've been praying for me, and I appreciate that. I need all the prayer I can get. Amen? Amen. Don't we all? Yes. So uh, please keep praying. Let's get to Ephesians 3. And uh, would you please get 2 Corinthians chapter 5 with your other hand, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now this is missions conference, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, Brother Bob alluded to the fact that I may address some of the things about, you know, missions and, and especially monetary parts of missions and giving, and I'm going to do that tomorrow night. So tomorrow night we're going to talk about your favorite subject, money, <laughs> right? Now nobody will come tomorrow night after I said that. We just look at what the Bible says. I want to know what the Bible says. I want to know what the Bible says about any subject that I have to deal with in my life. I want to know what the Bible says about it. Yes. We'll do that tomorrow night. Tonight's a little bit different. Ephesians 3, 2 Corinthians 5. And if you're able, would you please stand? Let's honor the reading of the Word of God. By the way, as far as this veterans ministry, I believe in it. Um, the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. I personally believe when a man or a woman gives up two, four, six, eight, ten years of their lives, goes to places like Afghanistan and Iraq and uh, worse to defend us and to keep us to enjoying this, I think they're worthy of some help. That's my personal opinion. I think there's two heroes left in this world, missionaries and military. And there's not many of them left, and they're definitely not athletes. Those are not heroes. Those are people getting paid $20 million to play a game. Those are not heroes. Heroes are military and missionary. Now the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 14. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Paul the Apostle says this, talking to the church at Ephesus, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Now, I want you to notice this is Paul's prayer for them. You know, what he's, you know where he is when he's writing this, don't you? He's in prison. You imagine being in prison and praying for somebody else? If I was in prison, I'd be praying for me. <laughs> I would. I'd say, God, please get me out of here. You think I'd be sitting around worrying about you if I was in prison? Most of us wouldn't. He's burdened for the people in Ephesus and he's praying for them. And he's praying in verse 17 that Christ would dwell in their hearts that being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend. He says, I want you to be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And he's praying that they would know the what? Love of Christ. Christ. Y'all here, aren't you? I need you to help me tonight. The love of Christ. He's talking to saved people, isn't he? But he says, I want you to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. All right? So he says, I'm praying that you'll know the love of Christ. Now, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14. Paul the apostle says to the church in Corinth, For thee, what? There it is again, the love of Christ. The subject tonight is the love of Christ. And here Paul says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then were all dead. And that he died for all, forget the Calvinist, he died for all. Amen. He didn't die just for the elect. He didn't just die for the frozen chosen. He died for all. Amen. Amen. It says, And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves but unto him which died for them and rose again. Let's pray, please. Dear Father, I am thankful to be here. I'm thankful to try to uh, to have the opportunity to try to help the cause of Christ, to make a difference in the area of missions, to help Victory Baptist Church. Lord, I've known Brother Schoolfield for a long time now. I'd sure like to be a blessing to him as well. And God, I know I'm unworthy. I know I'm undeserving. But I ask you, Lord, even now, as I stand here and pray, that you'd stir the hearts of your people, that they would glean from the Word of God what they need tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would uh, that you would show up. God, we need your presence. We need your touch. We need you. Amen. God, I know my unworthiness. I'm asking you to take this vessel, this this um, 
a frail creature of dust, Lord, this base, weak, despised thing of naught, and allow the Holy Ghost to do through me what I can't do. God, I ask it not because I deserve it. I ask it because of the blood of Jesus, and I ask it by your mercy, and pray you'd bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. So I've just made it very, very clear what I'm going to talk about tonight. There's no great insight. There's no, uh, I don't have a catchy outline for you. Uh, I want to talk to you tonight about something that seems like should not need to be talked about, uh, but I'm convinced it does. I want to talk to you about the love of Christ. And what I want you to grab right here at the first is that Paul, writing to believers, writing to save people, is praying what he says there in verse 19, look at it, he's praying that they would know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge. He says, I want you to know what can't be known. Do y'all notice how that's worded? I want you to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. What that means is I want you to know something that really can't be known, which means tonight I'm going to try to say what can't be said and explain what cannot be explained. That's, that's my task tonight. It really is a difficult thing. You would think it would be simple to say God loves you. But Paul is praying that they would know the love of Christ. And he's addressing saved people. Here's what I know based on that. This love of Christ is a lot deeper than we realize. Yes, it is. We'll say God loves me, but we say it so flippantly. Now, I, I, I've already told you what I'm going to preach on tonight, and I'm going to beat it to death. Okay? I, I mean, you think, well, let me, let me just put it this way. When we talk about love, we use that very word too flippantly. Uh, Paul is praying that they would know, by the way, there's another good word, know. The Bible says Adam knew Eve. And then she had a baby. That word know is a lot more than just knowledge. It's a lot more than information. There's, <coughs> excuse me, there's something deeper about it that has to get down in your soul. And Paul is saying, I'm praying that you might know the love of Christ. It's a knowledge beyond salvation. If you're saved, this won't hurt you. Say amen. amen. Okay? So you know God. God knows you. But after you get saved, Paul is praying you'll know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. This is a lot more than just being saved. What's indicated, by the way, in this verse 19, is if we knew the love of Christ like we ought to, we might be filled with the fullness of God. Yeah. I don't know many people that are filled with the fullness of God. Now, I'm not talking about being saved. I'm talking about the fullness of God. And Paul's talking to saved people, saying if you knew this, you might be filled with the fullness of God. So all of this is just deeper than we think. Love is deeper than we think. Somebody said love doesn't make the world go around. It's just what makes the ride worthwhile. I would agree with that. Somebody said love is an act of endless forgiveness. Not bad. Love is when the other person's happiness is more important than your own. That sort of hurts me a little bit. i got to be honest. I think women have an easier time loving than men do. I think men are too selfish. Love is when the other person's happiness is more important than your own. Someone said passion is momentary, but love is enduring. I like this one. Somebody said, love, like the measles, is more dangerous when it comes late in life. <laughs> I would have to agree with that. Love, someone said, is the most ferocious and strongest force on the planet. A lot of truth in that. Now, I said all that to say this, and to be very serious about it. I'll dare you to define the word love. Just get your piece of paper sometime, write down the word love, and try to write your definition. It's not as simple as you think. I've tried it. Love, and then define it. Man, it's not as easy as you might think. Listen to me. The 1956, sitting on my study in my house, is a 1956 Webster's Dictionary. I looked up the word love. I thought it was so intriguing, at least the end one. It says, a feeling of strong personal attachment, ardent affection, strong liking, fondness. Here's what I thought was interesting. Tender and passionate affection for one of the opposite sex. That's in a dictionary. That's not how America defines it anymore, is it? It says for one of the opposite sex. So then I've got my 1828 Webster's. That's the Baptist dictionary, right? 
Everybody likes the 1828 Webster's. It's not perfect. It has its flaws, but it's pretty good. Listen to what it said. I thought this was amazing. In an 1828 Webster's Dictionary, under the word love, number one, it said to be pleased with, to regard with affection. Number two, it said we love a friend, we love our parents, we love our children. And then I thought it was interesting. In the 1828 Dictionary, we love cool shade in the summer. We love a warm room in the winter. The Christian loves his Bible. Dictionary talking here. Not a preacher, not a commentary, a dictionary. Listen to what he said in the dictionary. The Christian loves his Bible. In short, we love whatever gives us pleasure and delight. And if our hearts are right, we love God above all things. An 1828 dictionary says, If my heart is right, I love God above all things. But as Americans, we say, I love books. I love ice cream. I love sports. I love my truck. I love to shop. I love my shoes. Oh, I just love your hair. We love everything, right? That's just who we are. We use that word sort of flippantly. We use that word sort of loosely. But again, the question is how to define this thing love. So then I pull out my etymology dictionary. That's my favorite book. I've got a 1956, 1828. But then I put out the word, the etymology dictionary, which gives you the origin of a word. And I thought it was so interesting, Brother Schoolfield. I looked up the word love in that etymology book, and it said, see the word leave. L-E-A-V-E. -E. And I thought, what in the world? And then it dawned on me. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave isn't that what it says? Yeah, Unto his wife. Is it possible that love means you might have to leave something? Or someone? I've got four children. My son Jacob was the first of the four to get married. He's not the oldest of our children. But Jacob and I were uh, very close as he was growing up. Jacob and I did everything together. We are still very close. By the way, he's going to come tomorrow night. And he and I are very close. And uh, I don't know that a father could be any closer to a son than me and Jacob. It's just, it's a blessing. And uh, we, we hunted together, we, we fished together, we worked on projects together, we worked on trucks and four-wheelers together, we went street preaching together, we knocked on doors together. Me and Jacob were very close. I mean, I don't know that life could be any better for a son than it was for Jacob living in my house. Free rent, free meals, best company in the world. And then a 16-year-old girl from Texas showed up. <laughs> and this son that acted like I hung the moon all of a sudden didn't know I was in the world. Oh, he was so preoccupied with this good-looking girl from Texas. You know what he did? Moved out. <laughs> Some other powerful love showed up in his life. And then, of course, I had Stephen. That's my oldest son. And I thought, well, at least I still got him around. That didn't last long. Some girl from somewhere showed up. <laughs> and Stephen left me. But see, I know real love. Girls love daddy. See, I got two girls. And they used to go around when they was five years old. And you know what? I'm serious as a heart attack. You know what that saying? I'm going to marry daddy when I grow up. I like that song. That's all that they'd come around the house saying, I'm going to marry daddy when I grow up. Lied like a dog. <laughs> Man, I love Kelly, my oldest daughter. Uh, she was getting to be about 26, 27. She said, Daddy, I'm just going to be an old maid. Nobody's ever going to marry me and all this stuff. Next thing you know, the right guy said the right word. And Kelly just said, Daddy, bye. <laughs> And then my youngest daughter, and she's the one that, I mean, I rocked her until I couldn't even stand up after I got through rocking her to sleep. I rocked her until she was probably 12. I'm exaggerating just a little bit. <laughs> but me and her were real close, and she loved to be with me all the time. One time she told me, she said, Daddy, I can never get married because I couldn't marry, I couldn't love anybody like I love you. I like that. She lied. <laughs> Why? Because somebody showed up, some old sorry bum. <laughs> I mean, not worth shooting, showed up and showed interest. And Amy said, bye, Daddy. Oh, that was tough. But you know what? That, that taught me something about this word love when I saw that word in the etymology dictionary. Leave. In 1978, I married Rhonda. We've been married for almost 46 years. And, 
And uh, she had a good home and a good family and a good mom and a good daddy. I didn't have it. I had a drunken daddy who beat my mom and beat the kids. And I was around shooting and, 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 and knife fights. And all of my life was just a mess. But Rhonda grew up in a great home and a peaceful home, a joyful home. And went off with me to Texas. She left something so wonderful. Because love, evidently, Based on what I can tell, based on my understanding of what I've read in the Bible and what I've read in other places to try to understand this thing, is love might cause you to leave a lesser love. It might cause you to leave a different love. I mean, what kind of love would leave heaven and holiness for the likes of us? What kind of love would do that? You and I probably know examples better than we know definitions. The greatest example, perhaps, of love in the Bible is Genesis 22. It's the first time you find the word love in the Bible. You know this stuff. Abraham takes his only son Isaac, goes out there and takes a knife, and he's going to kill him as an offering to God because God told him to. Genesis 22. But he loved his son. And that's a father-son. I, I tell you, that's a strong love. You know what? When my wife had four children, I got to hold them before she did. She had four major surgeries. And when that baby was born, they took that baby and placed that baby in my hands. And when I, when I held my firstborn, Stephen, for the first time, I didn't know there could be any love bigger than that, better than that, greater than that, deeper than that. Man, I love my son. But you know what? Now he's 40, and I think I love him more than I did the day they put him in my arms. Because real love grows. Real love is strong. Real love intensifies. Real love is not something... Listen, I believe right now I love my children when I did when they were 10. I, I don't stop loving them. Then, then there's the love of a mother. I don't love anything stronger than the love of a mother for her child. My wife or my mama took a beating. My mom, I've seen blood rolling down both sides of her face. I've seen what my, my dad and others did to her. She come out of an impoverished, impoverished life. I'll tell you more about it in a minute. And yet she, one time we caught her eating the hamburger with no meat in it. With enough meat. The things my mother went through, there's something awful powerful about a mother's love. And then there's a love, of course, for a, a husband, for his wife, and a wife for the husband. And then in our world, we are uh, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, lovers of music. Lovers of history, lovers of country. Americans love food. Amen. Yeah, I like Shawnee's. Amen, Brother Martin. Yeah, I like it too. We, I love pizza. I love peanut butter. I love, you know, we, we say we love all these things as if we know what love is. But no matter what way I illustrate this word love, every illustration, every definition is going to fall short. The message is about Jesus Christ. And in particular, His love for us. Now we're going to get to 2 Corinthians 5, but hang in there with me. Go to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I, th I find these verses in the Bible so intriguing. You know what somebody said? Well, God loves everybody. Well, I know that. But does he love everybody the same? I can answer that. Absolutely not. And if you think he does, you're just wrong. It's not what the Bible says. I mean, I did read where it says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Yes, Didn't I read that? Yes. So it looks like me loved Jacob when he did Esau. And the Bible says, it's, it's just interesting. I mean, I'll just show it to you real quick. 11, 5, John 11, 5. It says, now Jesus loved Martha <laughs> and her sister and Elijah. Well, why does the Bible tell you that? He loves everybody, doesn't he? But somehow the Bible wants you to know he loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Luke chapter 11, verse 33. Chapter 11, verse 33. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned, and the spirit was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. Talking about Lazarus. Look at chapter 13, verse 23. Look at chapter 13, verse 23. Just a few verses on this subject of the love of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in chapter 13, in verse 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples. Who is that disciple? That's John. Look at it. Whom Jesus loved. Do you know what tells you that five times? Why does the Bible go to the trouble of explaining and, and really highlighting the fact that John is the disciple that Jesus loved? Isn't that what it says? 
We say he loves everybody. Well, there's something different about this love. The Bible says this in John chapter 15, verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. I, th these things just get my attention. They make me stop and think about the love of Christ. And that's what I'm trying to get you to do for a little while. And I, I hope I can drive this home where you'll get it maybe a little bit better than you have in the past. It's not rocket science. It's, this isn't any great insight. I'm trying to get you to think a little bit tonight. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse 17. This is the rich young ruler. And when he was gone forth in the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. He's kneeling to Jesus and asking, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. defraud not. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said to Jesus, he answered and said to him, Master, all these have I observed from thy youth. I think this is so intriguing. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him. Why does God single that out? If we're going to say he loves everybody, why do you need to be told that he loved Lazarus, that he loved Martha, Martha, that he loved John five times, and here, beholding him, how he loved him? Take your Bible and turn to Ephesians chapter 3. That's our text, Ephesians chapter 3. When I think of this, and this wasn't true until about three or four years ago, it, it gives me great motivation. I'll explain it as we go. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, look at verse 17. Now this, this is sort of a slap in the face of independent Baptists in some ways. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Now look at it. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, look at it, being rooted and grounded in doctrine. You know what it says is rooted and grounded in standards. It's not what it says. I'm for doctrine. I believe you need to be doctrinally sound. I'm for standards. I, you can't get too high standards to suit me. But it doesn't say grounded in doctrine here, standard. By the way, it doesn't even say rooted and grounded in soul winning. It says rooted and grounded in love. I'm going to say this. If I get in trouble, I get in trouble. Brother Bob told me not to come back tomorrow night. That's fine. That's what he wants to do. If independent Baptists had more love, they'd get a lot more done. Amen. They are more interested in attacking the person that disagrees with them about, uh, I don't know, bluegrass music or the gap. I know where I stand on the gap, and I don't care whether you agree with me about it or not. I can still love you, and I can still work with you, and I can still support you as a missionary if you disagree with me about the gap. If you disagree with me about Christmas trees, I can still, I can still support you. If you disagree with me about Easter, I can still support you. I'm supposed to be rooted and grounded in love. Amen. Isn't that what it says? Yeah. Now bear with me. Look what it says next. Look at it. Follow along. Verse 18. This is intriguing. I've got to get your help on this one. It says that if you're rooted and grounded in love, you may be able to comprehend. This is such an amazing verse. Comprehend with all saints what is the breadth. Now get it. What is the breadth and length and depth and height of what? The sin, it, it, then it goes on to say to know the love of Christ. But it says that you might be able to comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height of what? It evidently means the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height of the love of God. The love of Christ, right? Now I'm glad you got these boxes in here. What are we going to talk about? It? Breadth, length, depth, and height. Okay, which one is the breadth? You going to guess? Me too. That's about what I think. Go ahead and tell me, brother. I guess this part. This is the bread? Yeah. Okay, what's the length? <laughs> well. Oh, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, well. You got me. Okay. Yeah. You got, which one's the bread, brother Bob? This is this the, is the bread. This is the length. The length. This is depth. Depth. This is height. Ah, okay, so the depth and height are the same. Basically. Basically. <laughs> you know what I think? I think you might be right. But I also think that there's such a dimension of God's love that you can't even describe it. Good point. I think there's a fourth dimension that we don't even comprehend. Good point. Now, I, I agree, Brother Bob, if I'm in Christ, okay, then there's the breadth and the length 
and the depth and the height and, and, and all those dimensions are relevant. I, I wouldn't argue that point, but I think what he's saying here is for the most of us to know this breadth, length, depth, and height of the love of Christ, it's just incomprehensible. We, we can't even explain it hardly. But I'm not through. Bear with me. I would say that this love is, first of all, a love of compassion. Now, I want you, I want you to hang in there with me. Hey, do you believe God loves you? Say amen. Okay, then it's a love of compassion. It's not a love of admiration. No, no. Would you agree with me? It's a love of compassion. It's not a love of appreciation. God didn't look down and say, now, oh, now there's a catch. <laughs> Can I tell you something? You're not a great catch. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amen. You're not a great catch. Catch like me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, brother. You wished it was. You ever said this? You'll see some guy with some girl, and you'll say, "What in this world did she see in him?" Amen. Some real good-looking girl running around with these boys back here. <laughs> you think she must be blind? Or it's the other way around. I mean, good-looking guy, and he's got this girl, and you're thinking, man, what's he seeing her? She looks like a fence post. <laughs> well, what in the world God see in us? That's a good point. Yeah. Nothing. We're trying to figure out the love of Christ. I'm saying number one has to be a love of compassion. Number two, it's a love of action. Real love must act. Yes. Real love does something. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 18, love, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Real love will act if it's real love. It's a love of action. Let me say number three, it's a love of fruition. It's a love of fruition. Love does something. Love has an effect on its recipient. Please hear me. His love changed my life. His love delivered me from hell. His love saved me from the guilt of sin and the curse of the law and the power of death. His love did something in my life. It transforms, it motivates, it comforts. His love is so powerful, it produces fruit. Yeah. It's a love of compassion, it's a love of action, it's a love of fruition. And again, I would say the breadth, His love is as wide as the world or as far as sin has reached. And concerning the length, his love was before time and it'll be here after time. Amen. And concerning the depth, it stooped all the way down to this cursed earth and even into the lowest hell. Amen. And concerning the height, it reached to the highest heaven, sprinkled blood oh. in heaven yeah. to wash my sins away. Thank God. It's incomprehensible. You know, men want to explore the depth of the ocean. They want to explore the solar system. They want to explore the human brain. They want to explore weather patterns. Why don't they study and explore something a lot more valuable, a lot deeper, a lot yeah, broader, yeah, a lot yeah, higher, yeah. and decide, I'm going to comprehend, study, think about, meditate on. I'm going to dwell on until I figure out the love of Christ. That's right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We're getting somewhere. Some of you are hanging in there and some of you... You ain't hanging too well. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5. We'll start with verse 8 this time. We started back down there in verse 14 a little while ago. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm trying to get you to think about the love of Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8. Paul says we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body than to be present with the Lord. What's this? Paul says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent absent, we may be accepted of him. Question, is Paul saved when he writes these words? <laughs> of course he is. And yet he says, I labor, I strive, I work, I sweat, I go after it so that I'll be accepted of him. It's interesting, isn't it? That word accepted is simple. It means that I might please him. That, that what I do, he would smile upon it. That what I do, he would favor. Paul says, my heart's desire, what motivates me, what compels me, what drives me, is that I want to please him. If you're saved, is that not what should be true of you? Yeah. Is that not what should be true of me? 
What is it that compels you? What gets you up in the morning? What keeps you going? What keeps you motivated? In America, people are motivated by looks. This is the most, this, this, I, listen, I'll give you one word that proves it. Selfie. Yes. I've never seen a generation like this generation always taking pictures of themselves. Well, you can go ahead and get in the altar. I don't care. <laughs> it, it's really, my, we really are stuck on an image. And everybody wants to look a certain way. And usually it's dictated by what Hollywood says. I want just, hey, I was thrilled to death when I walked in and saw all these young teenage boys. I mean, they reminded me of what I looked like when I was their age. Amen. Great. <laughs> hey, man. Hey, guys, I just want you to tell you, when I was 18, I was the best looking guy in my school. I know y'all can't believe that right now, but I was. You asked me what? At least I thought I was, okay? <laughs> and, and, you know, we, we just got this image and we want to look a certain way. I just want to tell you guys something. Somewhere around 35, it's going downhill. <laughs> You're wasting your time. I mean, all the muscles turn to fat. And everything in the chest goes to the gut. Amen. Right, Brother Bob? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> in other words, you can work on your image all you want to, but you got about 10 or 15 good years, and it's all downhill after that. Amen. Ain't much you can do about it. I'm just giving you the honest facts. And then, and then people are motivated by sports. They want to be a great athlete, the best athlete one of these days. They'll have to help him to the bathroom. That's true. You're right. Yeah. And then they're motivated by intellect and degrees and learning and getting all of this college stuff. Listen, do you realize if you live long enough, you probably won't even be able to call your wife's name? That's very true. What I'm saying to you is we're driven and motivated by things that are so temporal. But if we live to please God, it would last for eternity. Paul said, I'm living, I'm striving, I'm working, I'm laboring in order that I might please Him, that I might be accepted of Him. Then he says in verse 10, he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I'll just stop right there. He said, the reason I'm going to try to please Him is because I'm going to answer to Him. One of these days, I, listen, all of you guys, listen to me. One of these days you're going to stand before Jesus Christ. You're going to answer to Him for what you do with your life. I had a baseball coach in high school, basketball coach. I thought the world of them. They helped me. I went on to play college ball. It was my God. It meant more to me than anything else. And one time when I was a junior in high school, I pitched eight innings. You're only supposed to pitch seven. They let me pitch the eighth inning. It was getting close to dark. We didn't have any lights. And in the eighth inning, my coach, Leo Davis, walked out on the mound, called timeout, walked out on the mound, put his arm around me. And he said, Ron, he said, you got more heart than any young man I've ever coached. Now listen, I'm 17 years old. What do you think that meant to me? That meant the world to me. Can you imagine having the Son of God say to you one day, well done, my good and faithful son. If a baseball coach who's a sinner just like I am made me feel special because I had done something that impressed him, would to God I might do something in my life that impresses the God of heaven, hey. that pleases the God of heaven, that blesses the God of heaven. And then he says in verse 11, verse 11, he says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I'm just going to say this. I believe if you loved God, His passion would be your passion. Yes. Amen. If you and I loved God like we ought to and understood His love for us, what excites Him would excites us, what thrills us would hit Him would thrill us. And then we get to our bed first. We get to the message, okay? Now all that was introduction. <laughs> now look what he says in verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us. Now, when I first read read that years ago, I probably thought that meant my love for Jesus is what keeps me going. That's not what this verse is talking about. No, this is talking about his love for us. Now I want you to get this. Paul says, it is his love for me that constrains me. How do I know he's talking about his love for me? Look at the end of verse 14. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. We were all dead in sin. We were all lost in going to hell. But one died for every one of us. He's talking about his love for us. He loved us so much that he died for us. And then if I comprehend that love, look at what it says in verse 14. The love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And look at it. <coughs> 
and that he died for all. Why? That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. Yes. Mm -hmm. If I ever get a hold of this, I'll quit living for me. So I preached something one time. I preached it here. I don't know. I know I preached it at Cornerstone. I preached it all over this country. And the title of the sermon was The One Thing That Would Fix Everything. That was the title of the message. The One Thing That Would Fix Everything. And what I said in that message is that if we love the Lord like we ought to, that'd fix every problem we've got. Oh, yes. If we loved Him like we ought to, we'd serve Him. If we loved Him like we ought to, we'd read the Bible. If we loved Him like we ought to, we'd treat each other right. If we loved Him like we ought to, it would fix a lot of other problems. But Paul's saying something here that's even more profound. He's saying the truth of the matter is, if I would grasp more accurately and more deeply Christ's love for me, listen to me, if I would get a hold of, somehow comprehend his love for me, even when I don't love him, I do right. You have days where you don't necessarily love the Lord like you ought to? You know why y'all do right? Just thinking about how much he loves you. Yeah. That's what Paul said. Paul said it is the love of Christ that constrains me. Study that word constrain. It means to compel, to urge on, to hold in custody. Paul said I cannot escape this love. It's like the siege of a city. When I think about his love for me, it's laid hold on me and I can't get away from it. I wake up thinking about it. I go to bed thinking about it. It keeps me motivated. I've been stoned. I've been beaten. I've been in prison. But I can't quit when I think about how much he loved me. The Bible says... In John, 1 John 3, 16, hereby perceive we the love of God. Perceive. We know. Here, how do we know? That he laid down his life for his brethren. Alan Redpath, one of my favorite authors, said, in light of the cross, it is a scandal to live like we do. Oh, yeah. In light of the cross, it is a scandal to live like we do. John 15, we quoted it earlier. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. In Romans 5, 8, but God commended his love toward us. And then while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Such a love, listen to me, such a love captivated Paul to die daily, endure stonings and beatings in prison because he wanted to please the Lord. And that same love can't even get me to walk across the street. Y'all getting this? A love that turned Saul of Tarsus into Paul the Apostle. It is a love that drove him into Arabia for three years to learn what God wanted him to get. It is a love that, that took him from Antioch and to Antioch to strengthen the church. It is a love that led him all around Galatia to plant one church after another. It is a love that sent him to Jerusalem to defend a bunch of Gentile dogs. It's a love that, that moved him to collect money to give to poor saints he did not even know. It's a love that emboldened him to stand before kings and governors with boldness and tell them about Jesus Christ. It is a love that helped him keep the faith and finish his course no matter what he had been through and say, I fought a good fight. And for some reason, that love can't get American Christians out of bed away from the television and off the phone. Amen. Wow. And I'm telling you, there's a reason. And it's because we do not comprehend the love of Christ. Yeah. Someone said, we have become a generation <coughs> of people who worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. Amen. We're a generation that Worship our work, work at our play, and play at our worship. Such love, Christ's love, that Paul said constrained him, kept him going, motivated him, moved him, stirred him. That love, when I read my Bible, the love of Christ is more concerned, more interested in a sinful woman's tears than the Pharisees' prayers. That love, the love of Christ, is more interested in ministering to a leper than being crowned king. Amen. That kind of love, the Christ-like love, is more interested in a beggar than the applause of men. The love of Christ is more moved by a hungry crowd than his own personal needs. The love of Christ is persistent in loving with no regard for the cost. 
The love of Christ expresses itself and empties itself even when he gets nothing in return. It's the love of Christ. It's the love of Christ that gripped and sustained and held and captive, sieged Paul's heart. And somehow we're not moved by that love. That unexplainable, incomprehensible, yet clearly manifested love for us. <clears throat> People say they love John 3.16. I do too. I appreciate John 3.16. But please get this. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, who shall believe in him, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world. If I had to pick one verse in my favorite verse, which I hope I never have to do, <laughs> but at this moment it would be Galatians 2.20. Paul the Apostle said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. If you hadn't been here, and the rest of the world hadn't been here, it had died for me. Amen. He loved me. He loved you. I don't know if all of you understand this. Maybe there's some people here tonight, you've never been born again. Let me, let me just throw this in there real quick. Being saved does not mean being a Baptist or a Methodist or Presbyterian or Church of God or Jehovah's Witness or Catholic or a Mormon or a Seventh Day. It doesn't mean any of that. Being born again, being saved, knowing you're going to heaven when you die is having Christ in your heart. Amen. It's trusting what Jesus did for you on the cross. What did He do on the cross? He took your place. Because Jesus Christ was God in heaven. He became God in the flesh on this earth. And he looked forward in time 2,000 years ago. He looked forward in time and saw you and said, I'll go to the cross for him. I'll go to the cross for her. I love him. I'll die in his place. He deserves to die, but I'll die for him. Years ago, a man knocked on the door over in DeKalb County, Smith in Tennessee. And when he knocked on the door, he was door knocking. He was witnessing me. A, a man opened the door and he said, when that man opened the door and I looked at his face, he said, I cringed. He said, I've never seen anything more hideous, unsightly. He said, it just it just immediately ripped my heart out. It, it, he said, he didn't even look human. And he said, I tried not to show any expression, but the man invited me in. We began to talk. <clears throat> and he said, we hadn't been talking long until about four or five kids came running in the house and crawling all over him, jumped up on his lap, hugging him and kissing that face. And he said, I was so impressed with those kids and their love for this man, obviously their daddy. He said, they loved him so much, but he said, there was something even more impressive when I heard the whole story and found out that his house had caught on fire years ago and that he ran into the flames to rescue those kids. And it was because he rescued them that they loved him so much. Do I need to say that again? It's because he rescued them Amen. from the flames of hell. That's what God did for you. Amen. It's his love. It's not my love for him that's so impressive. I don't love him. He shouldn't love me. Amen. I don't deserve such love. My mom's love for my dad was mind-boggling. My dad would beat her. My dad, my dad did some terrible things. He had women all across the country. He drove an 18-wheeler. He, uh, he beat some of the kids, especially my older brothers and sisters. And uh, I don't know what, I, I don't know how to explain this. I've got a picture of my mom. It, it's one of my favorite pictures. I've got, I got a picture of my wife, by the way, looking at me like I saw my mom looking at my dad. And there he is in a hospital bed. Most of the time I, he was in, in prison or in a truck. He's in a hospital bed. And there my mom is, faithful to the end. She never left him. I'm talking about beat her with both fists. I'm talking about I, this. No woman would stay with a man like that. But she did. Years after that, my dad died when I was eight. And my mom died when I was 18. And years after, I heard the true story about what happened with my mom. She grew up in unbelievable poverty. And um, I won't describe the kind of life that she had. But when she was 13, he rescued her from that life. And I'm convinced that because he rescued her, she never stopped loving him. You know, it's hard to put this kind of love on terms we can understand. 
I, I've, I've honestly struggled with this for years, and, and I still try to preach it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this love, the Bible says, in verse 14, constrains us. In verse 15, it obligates us to quit living for ourselves. In verse, I love verse 16, look at this. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. It's a wherefore. Thinking about his love for us means I don't, any, I don't know men after the flesh anymore. You know, I'm not going to judge a man by where he came from. I'm not going to judge a man by whether or not he's a Baptist or a Methodist. I'm not going to judge a man necessarily because he's white or black. I'm not going to judge him because he came from the other side of the tracks or from New York or from Alabama. I'm not going to judge him because of his last name. He's a millionaire. He's in poverty. I'm not going to judge him because he's got an education or he never got past the third grade. He's somebody God died for. Everybody you look at that you are disdained by, you despise, you look down your nose, you remember, God died for you. Paul said, that's why I'm going to judge him from now on. Somebody Jesus died for him. Well, that stopped a lot of the mess we got ourselves into, wouldn't it? I no longer am going to judge men after the flesh. So this love in verse, in verse 14 constrains me. Verse 15, it obligates me. In verse 16, it enlightens me. In verse 17, it transforms me. There's a lot of things that motivate people. Young athletes are motivated by Steph Curry, LeBron James, Tiger Woods, or whoever. Young businessmen are motivated by Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or Donald Trump. Young missionaries are often motivated by Brainerd or Studd or Kerry or whoever it might be, John Patton. But who motivated Paul? You know what, what, what bothers me sometimes when I'm preaching? I'll try to come up with a great illustration to motivate people, and I'll usually think of an athlete or a soldier. Because all, there's these, these, you know, like these marathon guys, and all they go through and they train and they do all this stuff, and then they go and they win the Olympics and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then there's these, these soldiers that, you know, they, they held the fort and they, they, they stood on that hill and, and they fought until the one arm was shot off and then one leg was about shot and they just kept, well, that motivates me. Oh, well, so I don't need that to motivate me. I don't need that to get me out of bed. I don't need that to keep me going. All I got to do is just remember how much Christ loved me. And whether I love him or not, whether I'm tired or not, whether I've been beaten, stoned, shipwrecked or not, whether people hate me and I have to be dropped down over a wall in a basket to get out of town on my getaway camel. <laughs> he said, it really just doesn't matter. I'm not quitting because I am held, bound, captivated by Christ's love for me. That love's always there, is it not? It is. You see, somehow, and I'm about to wrap this up, somehow we uh, we don't grasp the bigness of Christ's love for us. And I'm going to tell you, I'm pretty sure I know part of why. I'm looking up a verse real quick. I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> you see, when we love, we think the object of our love is worthy of our love. They're beautiful. I fell in love with Rhonda at first sight. I'm telling you, I did. Man, I don't know what grade it was. Tenth, I think. But when we when we love, it's because we think that person is worthy of our love. They're beautiful. They got a great spirit. They're kind. They're caring, and so we love them. But Christ's love is for a worm. Amen. His love is for withering grass and filthy rags. Over there in Deuteronomy, let me, just, let me just read this real quickly. This is God's love for Israel in Deuteronomy 7. Here's his love for Israel. It says, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. <laughs> he said, The reason I loved you is because I loved you. It's not because of who you were, it's because of who I am. He actually, he actually describes, it's an amazing, I'm sure most of you have studied this thing about what Israel looked like when, when, uh, when God started loving on Israel. And the Bible explains it in Ezekiel 16. I'll just read it to you very quickly. I want to ask you to turn here. In Ezekiel 16, he describes Israel. Here's what he says about it. He says, Thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, Thy birth, he's talking about Jews, the, the, the nation of Israel that he loved so dearly, Thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Emirate. Thy mother was a Hittite. And as for thy nativity, <coughs> excuse me, when you were born, uh, thou was born, thy navel was not cut, neither was thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou was not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do these things unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. Thou was cast out into an open field to the loathing of thy person. 
He said, when you was born, you weren't washed, cleaned up, or swaddled. You weren't wrapped and decorated and put powder on you. They just threw you out in an open field and looking like that with blood and filth all over you. I loved you. What a love for Israel. My point is this. We love because we think the object of our love is worthy. God's love for us. We didn't deserve it. When we love, think about it, it's often because somebody seems interested in us. Probably we'd quit loving pretty quick if they didn't have any kind of return. <laughs> but Christ loved us and he wasn't even on our radar. He was loving me when I wasn't even thinking about him. When we love, it's usually someone who has some similar interest that we have. He loves somebody that could not be more unlike him. You know, a young man will love, or think he loves, get married, and about three or four years into it, he didn't know what that love was going to cost him. When Jesus went to the cross, he knew full well what it was going to cost him to love by the school fields. He knew what it was going to cost him to love Ron Rapp. It was going to cost him his blood. It was going to cost him the spitting and the shame and the mockery and the whip and the crown of thorns and the spear in his side and bit on the cross and having his eternal father forsake him. But he did it for me. That's how much he loved us. He loved us enough to go through all of that because he cared about us and he wanted to help us. And my argument tonight, listen, Jesus knew what it was going to cost him. I cannot explain his love. I cannot articulate his love. I cannot paint a picture that would help you to see his love. But if his love for man can compel and drive and, and keep Paul going, why can't it compel me? Why do I get discouraged just because somebody didn't like the sermon? I get discouraged just because somebody didn't show back up on Sunday night? God, I've been serving you so faithful and they didn't come to hear me preach. I'm quitting. <laughs> I got cancer. I'm quitting. No. Maybe, maybe the reason I don't appreciate it is because I think I deserve it. Well, I don't. Maybe it's because I don't realize the greatness of it. Maybe, maybe I'm blinded by a love for other things. Amen. You ever studied why maybe we get the Gospels? You know, for example, they say Mark might have been written first, but we get Matthew first. <laughs> and, and we don't even know the chronology of the New Testament. You ever wondered why God put those four books at the beginning of the New Testament? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I think it has to be so we could see love poured out. Because you don't, you're not going to come into Romans and start telling me how to live my life if I hadn't seen that love poured out. When I've seen that love poured out, maybe I am supposed to quit living for myself and start living for him. What I see in the gospel is the love of Christ poured out on mankind. I see a leper, a leper, and Jesus put forth his hand and touched him. I see a beggar. He's calling out to Jesus, son of David. And everybody said, shh, hush, be quiet, be still, shut up. And he cried out the more. The Bible says the sun stood still, the S-O-N, for that beggar. There's a tax collector, the dreaded IRS. <laughs> Jesus looked up and said, man, I'm eating at your house today. There's that Samaritan woman, that outcast, that half-breed, that woman that nobody wanted to have anything to do with. And Jesus said, I got some water for you, lady. There's those 12 dirty disciples, filthy, no doubt. He said, take your shoes off. I'm washing your feet. There's that adulterous woman caught in the very act. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn thee. There's that Canaanite woman. He called her a dog and said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. There's a group of children. The disciples are saying, get out of here. Get, 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 get. Uh-uh, Jesus said, you, you let them come and sit on my back. There's a man with an unclean spirit. Jesus said, hold thy peace. There's that man of Gadara. He's got 2,000 devils. Jesus gave them leave. There's that sickly woman. She's got an issue of blood. Jesus said, daughter, go in peace. 
There's a soldier. He said, I have not found so great a faith. There's Thomas the doubter, Peter the denier. He could have let Peter just, he could have just turned him loose. Oh, yeah. He said, Peter, I'm not through with you. Yeah, you denied me three times. It's an embarrassment. But I got a plan for you, Peter. And Peter, I want you to know something. Even though you messed up, I still love you. Listen to me, church. Cornerstone, I tell Cornerstone this all the time. I'm telling Big for this tonight. God's not up in heaven just waiting for you to mess up so he can get you. God loves you. And you know what amazes me about the love of Christ? He looked across time. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ faced a courtroom, a cat of nine tails. They took that cat of nine tails, which is a, which is a handle. It's got, it's got nine strands of leather. At the end of the leather is glass and rock. And they take that thing and they take it across his back 39 times until his back was torn to shreds. I believe personally that he came across one time and when they pulled it back, I believe it knocked one of his eyes out of socket. We know for a fact that, that it's impossible to anybody live through what he went through except God. And he takes the cat of nine tails, he takes the cross, and he looks across time, and he says to the Father, Thy will be done. Because he looked across time 2,000 years and saw in 1978 an 18-year-old boy who was suicidal, grabbed a knife every morning, stuck it in his chest, and wanted to kill himself because his mama was dead. And Jesus looked across time, saw that 18-year-old boy, and said, I'll die for him. I love him. And in 1978, he saved me. But here's what amazes me. He knew when he saved me that even though I would waste time over the last 45 years and do my own thing and be self-centered and selfish, I'd sometimes put him off, wouldn't read my Bible, wouldn't pray, wouldn't tithe, no to God. And he still loved me. With an everlasting love. Listen to me. We've got a lady in our church. I'll be, I'll be quick here. She's got five or six kids. And I, she's one of those ladies. And ladies just have a love that I think is, I just think is special. I just think ladies are, they have an easier time loving than we do. And this woman loved her husband deeply and dearly and intimately. She practically idolized him. And those children did. They've been married for years. And you know what he did just a few years ago? Just walked out. I mean, just boom, he's gone. For nothing. No reason. Except his own selfishness. And you know what everybody's wondering? How could you walk away from a love like that? Those kids idolized him, she idolized him, loved him with all their heart, and walk away from him. It's the way I felt about my brother one time. When I was a kid, my mother was, a, bless her heart, she had taken all those beatings. After my dad died, she basically just did everything she could to keep her 10 children alive, took care of them. And my brother would go out and get drunk on a Friday night, do LSD and all kinds of junk, come home at 2 o'clock in the morning, and just ripped my mom's heart out. She'd be scared to death he's going to be in a wreck. And what he did to her, I couldn't understand. How can you do that to somebody that loves you so much? And I look at that man and say, how can you walk away from the one who loves you so much? And then God says, yeah, tell me about it. How can you deny me? How can you say no to me? How can you not even get up in the morning and not talk to me, knowing how much I love you? And so you see, I really think the problem is not necessarily that we don't love him like we ought to, though that's true. The reason is we don't comprehend his love for us. Because if I did, I'd be constrained by that love. Amen. If we could get a hold of this, it'd get us up tomorrow, and we'd do right. Amen. Could I ask you to stand with heads bowed?